Welcome to Teaching the Truth with Pastor Eric C. Bogan. Clearly define what I am to do. Let every word penetrate the heart. Let what is said leave them running to your arms. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. What we're sharing with you today, again, from the subject God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. Uh, as you know, we started this lesson. We introduced it to you on uh, last week. Um, this whole idea of uh, God's sovereignty and the sovereignty of God. Let me, again, give you the definition of sovereignty. Sovereignty is God's absolute power to do whatever he desires. Again, God's absolute power to do whatever he desires. Um, sovereignty also means that God's in control of all things. When we're talking about uh, the sovereignty of God, we're talking about that attribute which says that God controls all things, every event. Uh, there's not a single event that takes place um, in the earth that God is not in some way involved in. I want to share that with you. Look at Proverbs 16. Turn with there to Proverbs 16 with me. Proverbs chapter 16. There is no event uh, that takes place in the earth that God is not in some way involved. Proverbs 16, uh, verse 33. Proverbs 16 and 33. Verse 33, it reads, The lot is cast into the lap. But the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. I want to read that again. Verse 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. We don't hear much talk today about lots. Um, when we talk about lot, we're, we're not talking about Abraham's nephew, but the word lot here, let me give you a definition of what a lot is. A lot is an object could be any object, a pebble, a stone, dice, a coin that is used to make a decision according to a random outcome. Lots are used to make a decision according to a random outcome. Um, and lots in the ancient times, believe it or not, they were used to discern the will of God. And the reason for that is because the people in ancient times believe that even random events, random outcomes, like you would have if you cast a lot, rolled a dice, or flipped a coin, was controlled by God. You hear that? That God controls even the random events. Verse 33 says, even the lot is a decision of the Lord. So if you flip a coin, God not only knows what's what the result of that coin flip was going to be. He's determining it. He's determining it. And so when we think about that, when we think about the fact that God controls random events, what does that say about all events? If he's controlling even the flip of the coin, then he must also be behind all of the events that we see taking place in our world today. And this is why we said to you on last time, and we started with this, we, we said to you that God, um, that God will sometimes use evil events and evil people in order to bring to pass and accomplish his purposes. Now, if I was to say God used good events to accomplish his purpose, I mean, that, that's easy for us to wrap our minds around. It's easy for us to accept. But we got to understand that God is not only using good events, he's using 
bad events, evil events, calamities, whatever, trials, tribulations, troubles. He's using all of these things to accomplish his purposes because God is sovereign and he controls all things. And we share it with you out of the book of Isaiah. So I want us to go back there. Isaiah chapter 10. Let's turn over there. Isaiah 10. And um, there's so many passages in the word of God that really speaks to this whole idea of God being sovereign and controlling events, particularly, particularly evil events or negative or bad events. Um, here in Isaiah chapter 10, beginning at verse 5, O Assyria, the rod of mine anger, the staff in their hand is mine indignation, verse 6. I will send him against a hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him charge. God is speaking here about the king of Assyria. We know that the king of Assyria was not a good king. He was an evil king. He was a wicked king, one that brought destruction, not only upon the, the nations of the known world then, but on Israel. But notice, God is calling this evil king his rod and his staff. And, of course, the rod and staff is a reference to the shepherd's rod and the shepherd's staff. And so we can uh, 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 conclude from this that God is using this evil king as his tool to shepherd his people. He says, I will bring him against a hypocritical nation. And why is he bringing them, uh, him against his people? his people to accomplish his purposes. Look at verse 12, verse 12 of Isaiah 10. Notice, he says, Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord has performed his work, not when Assyria, but when the Lord has performed his work upon Mount Zion and Jerusalem. So we see here that God was using the king of Assyria. He was using the destruction that he brought against the people of God he was using that to perform and accomplish his work on Jerusalem, his work on his people. And so we can, we can see here that this was God's method. God used any and everything in order to bring about the salvation, the development of his people in the Old Testament. Now, we would think in our minds, well, that was God's method then. You know, desperate times call for desperate measures. But that's not his method now. And if we think that, we would be totally wrong. We would be absolutely wrong. For instance, if we go to Matthew chapter 18, let's turn over there. Matthew chapter 18, we're going to see that this whole method of God using every event, good event, bad events, using good, using evil in order to accomplish his purpose of developing and, um, and saving and delivering his people is something he's doing from the beginning all the way to the end of the Bible. Here in Matthew chapter 18, Matthew 18, this is a parable that Jesus uh, spoke to his disciples. We're going to pick up right at verse 32, Matthew 18 and 32. Notice verse 32 says, Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desireth me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I have had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, notice, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due. Verse 35, so likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses, their trespasses. Notice Jesus is, is telling his disciples and telling us indirectly that God will if need be, turn us over to the tormentors, to evil, if, he says, we do not forgive men their trespasses. So if we don't forgive men, if we said, oh, you know what, 
I'm not going to forgive you. And, and uh, you know, we like to keep people in prison or we like to require them to pay off their debt, you know, do a series of things uh, until we're satisfied that they've learned their lesson. If we do that to men, if we require them to pay off their debt, you know what Jesus says? Then the Lord will put us or turn us over to the tormentors. That is tribulation, trouble, difficult times until we've paid off our debt to him. So this is, again, the, the point I want you to see here is that God is not against using difficulty, using uh, negative situations, using, yes, I'm about to say it, evil in order to bring correction, training, development, even deliverance to his people. And as I said, this, this whole uh, idea is, is, you could see it throughout scripture, God using the good and the bad in order to bring about his purposes. I've got a few scriptures, verses for you. You know, we're not going to go through them all, but I thought you might want to uh, jot some of these down and read these later, some of these actual passages and verses that you can go to and, you know, do some study and begin to see. I got some from the Old Testament and the New Testament. So you can, you know, do this, you know. This is a good homework. I'm not going to do your homework for you, but you need to meditate on these things. Begin to see that, hey, this is God's MO. This is a method, and it demonstrates, these verses demonstrates that God uses all things. He uses all things, good things and bad things, to accomplish his purpose. Now, this brings us to the question and even begs the question, what reason, what reason could God possibly have in bringing evil upon his people? What purpose could he possibly be accomplishing by using evil, involving evil? What purpose could God be using evil for in regards to his people? Well, number one, repentance, repentance. This is one of the thing God, uh, the reason God uses evil in order to bring his people to repentance, to repentance. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. You know, believe it or not, evil has a, a, a real effective way of bringing people to repentance. Uh, some of you out there who are watching the broadcast, um, maybe one of the reasons some of you have even come to the Lord was because of difficulty in your life. Some evil that took place, some bad experience drove you uh, to come back to the Lord or, or come to the Lord. Because this is what, you know, uh, negative experiences, bad experiences have a way of doing for us sometimes, causing us to repent and turn to God. In 2 Corinthians 7, as we said, verse 8, let's look at verse 8 here. <clears throat> For though I made you sorry with a letter, Paul writes, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Paul is speaking here to the Corinthians. He, uh, he wrote them a letter that um, rebuked them and, in his words, made them sorry. He was acting on behalf of God as their apostle, as their minister. And he you know, spoke strong words to them, words that uh, caused a lot of grief and pain emotionally, psychologically. You know, a lot of times, you know, members, people in general don't like it when you talk hard to them. And maybe some of you here today, you know, you know, don't really appreciate pastors speaking hard about the things God often does in order to bring men to repentance, like bringing evil. Paul did that. He told the Corinthians, yes, I 
uh, 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 spoke to you in a very harsh way. I made you sorry, but he says, I don't repent. Let's look at verse 8 again. Notice, he says, I don't repent. I don't regret it, in other words. He says, though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not regret it. I do not repent. Why? He says, the reason why he didn't repent, he says, for I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though it were for, were for but a season. Verse 9, now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but you sorrowed to repentance. That's why he didn't regret it. it. It wasn't just the sorrow making them feel sorry. It's what the sorrow ultimately accomplished. And that was repentance. And so that's why Paul says, you know what? I did it and I'll do it again if it caused you to repent. You know, I, I believe the, the Lord is the same way. I believe that the Lord doesn't regret bringing pain in our life when that pain ends or results in repentance, in salvation. You know, parents are the same way. Parents don't regret the pain, the sorrow they bring their children if that pain brings a change in behavior, a change of mind. And this is the value of, of, of God being sovereign, sovereign over evil events is because it has a tendency of bringing us to a place of repentance. Um, but again, we don't hear much about this. We don't hear much talk about God uh, being so, uh, sovereign, particularly over evil events. Everybody would raise their hand and say, oh yeah, I believe God's in control. You know, we used to even wear t-shirts. God is in control. But we like to limit that control with only good things. Well, if God's in control, he's in control of everything. And but what makes God not evil in controlling everything is the purpose in which he uses it. He's not using it in order to make men feel sorry in, the, in and of itself. He's using it to make men repent, repent. And uh, but again, we don't like to hear this. We would much rather most of us would much rather think that all the bad and the negative and the evil that happens in our life is the result of the devil. Oh, it's just the devil. Oh, the devil this, the devil that. But let me tell you this. When you see the devil only in the negative in your life, you have no motivation to change. When when you assume that it's just the devil that brought you to these trials and tribulations, these issues, these things that are happening in your life. If everything negative happening in your life, it's just the devil, you know, you know, trying to make your life miserable, then guess what? There's no motivation on your part to change or repent because you just assume that the devil is just being the devil. It's not until we realize that God is behind some of these events that we then begin to examine our own self and say, why is God bringing this? What kind of change is he after? What am I doing to get in this position where he feels this is necessary? Now that's how change happens. In fact, if we look at Isaiah 26, let's turn to Isaiah 26. So it contains a very, very important principle here in Isaiah 26. And uh, we're going to take a look at verse 9. Uh, Isaiah 26 and verse 9. Notice. He says, with my soul, with my soul, I have desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth. The inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Notice the prophet is basically saying here, that men, particularly disobedient men, rebellious men, will only learn righteousness, will only learn to do right when judgments, when evil 
is in the world or in the earth. You can't teach rebellious people, disobedient people, righteousness by just keep giving them mercy. That's what we don't. In fact, that's something we need to learn. It's something that a lot of these modern parents need to realize. You know, I remember a day, there used to be a day that the, our parents' greatest tool of instruction was a strap or a switch or some other method of disciplining us. In fact, that's the word for discipline. You know, you, I'm going to discipline you. That means you were getting a spanking. That means some kind of trouble was about to happen to you. Now we, we assume that, you know, if we just keep showing kindness, we just keep showing mercy, then, the, then you know, our, our, our kids will be like, oh, you know, oh, my mom is so nice. Oh, my dad is so nice. They're so nice to me. Let me be nice back to them. No, no. The scripture says very clearly here in Isaiah, if you keep showing mercy to the wicked, they will never learn righteousness. You know the way men learn righteousness? You know the way men learn to do right, to turn away from evil? Is when judgments are in the earth. And when we see judgments in the earth, it's like some divine switch. Uh, some, you know, God's hand coming down here and, and he, is, it, he is encouraging uh, his people particularly to turn from their sins and do what is right. And do what is right. And, and the, I believe this is the reason why, you know, uh, people don't like to say this, but this pandemic that's in our world today. There are a lot of people that, that just assume that the, the pandemic is, you know, just some random disease, you know, ever so often, you know, you'll get these diseases, they'll, they'll come through and uh, you just have to, you know, uh, weather the storm until a, until a vaccine is found. But uh, th this is just common. <laughs> no, this is, this is, and see, see, that kind of talk has kept the church from repenting. It has kept the church from examining themselves and saying, why would God send a pandemic and evil that will take us off of our jobs, take us off of our daily lives, even take us out of our church? I, I believe, and this is my personal opinion, that God's trying to quarantine us because we've gotten to the place where we're being infected, not with the COVID. We're being infected by sin, sin in our congregation, sin in the world, and it is just spreading. And if he doesn't stop this, if he doesn't send everybody home to stop the spread of this virus called sin, rebellion, and wickedness, then it's going to wipe out his entire congregation, his church, his entire church, and he will have, he will have no presence in the earth. Now look at 2 Peter chapter 2. Let me show you. 2 Peter chapter 2. Yeah, I know this is hard talk, but, you know, we're going to have to start learning this about God. You know, it's, it's time for us to move from the ABCs. It's time for us to move from, you know, the, uh, uh, he's got the whole world in his hand and he, he loves all the little bitty babies to begin to realize that God is demanding things from these babies and in demanding that they grow up and that uh, babies will soon learn uh, that the mama that used to, you know, give them the googly eyes and, and uh, you know, laugh whenever they tee tee and poo poo, that child will begin to learn that that parent will begin to demand things from them and that they won't take some of this stuff off of them. You can't just be smacking mama in the face and you can't just be disobeying. You can't just be taking things off the shelf. You know, there's a no in there. We got to start saying no. And that's, this is God saying no. We need to learn that, that, that the, our heavenly father says no. Our heavenly father likes to spank spank. Our heavenly father requires obedience and discipline and uh, he, he you know he, he don't need no help getting it because he, he knows how to show you better than he could tell you second Peter chapter 2 second Peter chapter 2 verse 9 notice what the word of the Lord says the Lord knoweth the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and 
reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. We talk a whole lot about how God knows how to deliver you. You can, you can be, he can reach all the way down. You know, he knows how to deliver you out of anything. He can't. But I tell you what he also knows how to do. Not just deliver. He knows how to discipline. He knows how to, as he says in verse 9, he knows how to reserve the unjust, the disobedient. Keep them, notice, keep them in punishment. In punishment. Keep them unto the day of judgment to be punished. He'll put you in prison. You know what? He don't just mean the souls of the unjust. He's talking about the bodies that are still here present on the earth today. The unjust men and women. You know what God will do? He will keep you. He will, he will keep you in a, in a prison, a, a prison, a financial prison, a, a physical prison. He will, he will keep you in trouble. He's like, man, why am I always in trouble and I can't break out? Because you're being unjust. And he says the people who are unjust don't get out. They don't get out on probation. And some of you feel bound today, bound by circumstance, emotional, psychological. God will keep you in. You can't do nothing. It's like you, you can't win for losing. What is that? God wants you to repent. You know, before they let you out of prison, you got to go before the parole boards. And you know what they want to learn? They want to know, have you learned your lesson? Now, you go in that board all you want to and keep saying, you know, I, I was mad then and I'm still mad now. Well, you're going to stay right there. And I know Christians today who stay in trouble. They stay on God's bad side. They, they never enjoy prosperity. They never enjoy blessing. It's like they stay on God's bad side because you want to know why? They won't repent. They're still walking around with that crazy attitude. Harboring unforgiveness. Fighting with everybody. Oh, I tell you some of the people that he keeps in. He says in verse 10, notice, he tells you the people that he particularly keeps in prison. He says, but chiefly, verse 10, chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness that despise government presumptuous are they self-willed they're not afraid to speak evil of dignities he says the the ones that he keeps in prison the most the, the ones he reserves in judgment the longest are the those who operate in the lust of uncleanness you know what uncleanness is the word uncleanness, it means to dishonor your own nature. The people who, involve, who get involved in immoral acts that, dif, that dishonor their very nature, the way God made you, the way God created you, the word means to be tainted, to be dirty. It's where we get the word perverse. You know, there's some sins out there that make you dirty. We call it nasty. People that like to be nasty, God say, they stay in prison. See, the, the people, the, 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 the individuals that stay on God's bad side the most are the people who like to go around and act dirty, talk dirty, and be unclean. You know, the kind of people that you don't want to be associated with because it makes you dirty. And he says, not only those who walk in uncleanness or dishonor their body, but people, notice in verse 10, look back down at verse 10. He says, chiefly those who walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Speak evil of dignities. Listen to me. He's talking here about people who dishonor authority. So the people who stay on God's bad side are people who, who walk in immorality or nasty and people who don't respect authority, who don't respect authority. You need to respect authority and you need to respect yourself. You want to stay out of judgments? You want to keep the evil off of your head? Learn to respect authority and respect yourself. Respect what God made you to be. And I'm telling you, God's got judgment and he's going to pour. You know, see, look, you know, I could talk about it. See, but we, we see we this culture loves to disrespect authority. You can't you, teachers can't even teach because the students disrespect. them. 
parents can't even parent because the children's disrespect them. Paul said it. Perilous times are coming when they will disobey parents. They will walk in a dishonoring way. They don't respect the pastor. They don't respect the parent. They don't respect the teacher. They don't respect the governor. They don't respect the, the president. These are people God put in place. They don't respect law enforcement. You know, bleep the police, you know, doing all kinds of stuff. We say all kinds of stuff. God says, okay, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you what happens when you reject authority in Romans, he says, they bear not the sword in vain. And what we think, oh, it's just the devil. No, no, no. God had had enough. See, what happens is we do things for so long and we think God's forgotten. And when he finally does get us, we forgot we did it. And so we think, oh, man, that's unfair. How did you do this to me? Well, I can rewind the tape and look at all those times when you disrespected authority. And now you're getting it on your head. See, but we don't do that because you want to know why? We don't see God in it. It's because if we saw God in it, then we will know God's a righteous God and that if he brought it, it had to be a reason. And one of the main reasons he brings this stuff is to cause us to examine ourselves and to repent. Another reason God sends evil, it's not just repentance. Sometimes God will, will send evil in order to teach you to fight, in order to teach you to fight, in order to teach you to fight. Let's go to Luke chapter 10. And we, we, we can't assume that every time trouble comes our way, it's because we've done something. So that's the first thing you want to check. You, you want to examine your heart. Wait a minute. Now, wait, now, now Lord, did I do something? And listen, I'm going to tell you, when, when judgments or evil or trouble is in your life, uh, be, because of sin, because God's trying to get you to repent, you won't have to take long to, to examine your heart. It will be right in front of you. If, if you got to take a whole day to try to figure it out, it ain't, it ain't sin. If sin is, because number one, your conscience will be telling you. So, so, so whenever trouble happens to you, happens to your family, your finances, whatever, it ha evil in any way, the very first thing you want to do is check your heart. Oh, what? And it'll probably be right there. In fact, you've probably been looking over your shoulder and wondering when you're going to get hit by a truck. You, you'd be almost expecting it. I mean, you know, when your parent came home and woke you out your sleep with a spanking, you knew what it was. You thought by going to sleep, you could sleep it off. But w w when they start spanking you when you were asleep, uh, I mean, you, know, you didn't need, uh, what are you hitting me for? You already knew. You already knew. So the first thing we do, we ask ourselves, Lord, did I do anything? Is there something I need to be repentant of? You examine your heart. But if you say, like, no, nah, man, I'm, you know, hey, I'm rolling. Then God could be bringing it in because he wants you to fight. You know, God will make you go get your bike back. He will make you go fight the neighbor to teach you to stop being a pushover. Okay. Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, let's look at verse 3. He says, go your, he's talking to his disciples. He says, go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among the, I mean, when a lamb go in the middle of a, of a pack of wolves, how many know, somebody say evil. And notice, he didn't say you wandered into that pack of wolves. He says, I'm sending you to evil. As lambs among what? Wolves. Jump down to verse 17. And the 70 return. So he's, he's not just talking to the 12 apostles. Oh, that was Peter. No, he's talking to the 70. So all the members, all, not just the preachers, all the members. He says, he says to the 70, they returned again. Notice, with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. What just happened? You know what God did? You know, these 70, they just thought, look, man, I just came out here to listen to you preach, Jesus. I came to church to see you lay hands and folk get healed. You know what Jesus says? I'm about to send you to the sick. 
in, in Matthew, he says he sent them out, notice, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to set the captives free, to raise the dead. Meaning, Jesus sent these folk that had just got to church into environments, into places where people were not only sick, and, but they were dead. He put them in difficult situations. And what did he expect them to do? He says, heal the sick, raise the dead. He said, fight, 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 fight. And sometimes God will drop you right in the middle of trouble. To do what? Sit there and get your head beat in? No, fight. Put up your dukes. Put up your dukes. You're crying. You're crying to pastor. You're crying to the missionary. Stop crying to them. And stop crying to God and exercise authority. I said it to someone. I'm going to say it to y'all. When you're exercising authority, you don't pray. You say. Jesus in Mark 11, he didn't say pray to the mountain that it be removed. He said say to the mountain. You pray to God for grace, for strength, for encouragement, but you don't pray to the devil, you say to the devil. You don't pray in the middle of, you know, you see this person, they're about to fight, and they're praying. You're going to get your head beat in. You don't pray when you're fighting. No, you say when you're fighting. You tell that mountain to get out of your way. You tell that sickness to get out of your way. You don't say, ah, oh, in the name of Jesus, I pray that this sickness go. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Tell the sickness, get out of here. Tell the pain, get out of here. And why? God, God let it come to see if you will fight or you will just take it. And we just take the stuff off the devil. We just take it. Oh, I guess the devil wants my, wants my, wants my health. I guess, the, I guess the devil don't want me to walk today. What? The devil is a lie. Who, who said the devil had a right to stop you from walking? Let me share with you what Jesus says in verse 19. We're still in Luke 10. Luke 10 and 19. Verse 19 says, Behold, I give you power to act serpents and scorpions. No, to tread on them. He said, he said what, are you, what are you asking them for? Tread on. That means put them under your foot. And over some of the power, all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means what? He said, don't let no, nothing was going to hurt you. When it comes to the powers of darkness, serpents and scorpions, don't take no mess off. Of them. Now, let me, let me help you here, because if you if you miss this, you, you're going to miss a valuable lesson. Back in verse three, I don't know if you still have it. But Luke 17 and 3, remember he told them, I send you forth as lambs among the wolves. In Matthew, he says, I send you forth as lambs among the wolves. He says, be wise as serpents, be harmless as doves. So you guess what? I want you to listen to me on this. You don't fight dogs. You don't fight the wolves. You fight the serpents. Oh, that's just a very important lesson. I'm going to say it one more time. You don't wrestle against wolves. You run from them if you need to. But you don't run from no serpent and no scorpion. You stump on them. Like Kenny Rock, you got to know when to walk away. And you got to know when to fight. You know what the wolves represent? The wolves represents people, false prophets, individuals. He says, man, I'm sending you out there, and, and some folk ain't going to like what you're doing. He says, don't pay no attention. Just keep going. And if they start some stuff, uh, you flee from that city if you have to. We don't fight flesh. We don't fight people. So I want you to take in his word. Pastor told me, don't take no stuff off of you no more. No, that's the devil. Don't take no stuff off. You should, don't be putting your dukes up against people. Our fight is against the enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Those are the wolves. Those are the people. Jesus identified the false prophets many times as being wolves among the sheep. But the serpents, that's the devil. 
Don't take no mess off of him. Don't run. Don't ever run from a fight against the devil. Anybody have one of those parents? I told you. Don't don't. Don't ever run from that fight. Even if you got to stay there and get your head beat in. Don't run from no fight against the devil. Do not run from the devil and don't take nothing off of him. But here's the great thing. This I want you to see this. This is the this is the most amazing thing. Whenever God sends you into an arena to fight, you can almost guarantee you're going to win because he's trying to teach you that you've got power. It's a variable lesson. You, you're almost guaranteed to win. The only, the only fights you lose is the ones you don't fight when God sends you to, into, a, into, a, into an environment to fight. You're going to win. Remember, look back at verse 17 of Luke 10. He sent them out. These are people just converted. These people haven't been with the Lord long at all. The 70 return with sadness, disappointment. No. And notice they say, even the devils are subject to us. It's like they were shocked. Because you want to know why? It was all, the deck was already stacked. They were already going to win. I, I, I witnessed this myself early in my ministry. Soon after my father passed away and I stepped into this role as pastor. Early in my ministry, I mean, it's like stuff started happening to members in our congregation. And I would go into environments. I was in one environment and, and, and a man died right there in front of me, died right there in front of me. And everybody looked at me. So I just stood over him. And before I knew it, it started coming out of my mouth. I just started speaking life and commanding him, commanding his spirit to come back. And the man raised, came up from the dead, came up dead. Man was dead, came up from the dead. Another case, we were out. My wife and I were out visiting a sick. We were at the hospital and someone had just had a stroke and they had they had deformities. Uh, in their mouth and in their body, they, their, their mouth was twisted. We prayed, and right there, that deformity stretched, straightened out. What was God doing? He was trying to teach me that I am with you. That I created this situation so that you could fight and win, so that you and the devil will know, don't mess with you. My hand and my anointing is upon you. And I'm saying God does that not just with the 12, he does it with the 70. He's going to create situations in your life, in your family. And you, you won't be able to call for the pastor. No, you don't need the pastor. Right then and there, God wants you to fight. Speak over your family, speak over that situation, command it and demand it. Don't pray it, say it, and watch God do it, and he's going to do something for you. And then you're going to thank him for sending it. You know, there's, there's, there, there's something we need to realize that sometimes when evil comes, it's an opportunity for us to see the hand of God. It's an opportunity for us to finally exercise authority. If he never sent evil, we will never have an opportunity to use our sword and exercise authority. Go to Judges chapter 3. We're almost done here. Judges chapter 3. Come on, y'all. I'm telling you, this is going to help you. This is going to help you. Stop seeing the devil in everything. I know it sounds odd to say, but the more you see God in things, the more you will know how to respond. You will know how to respond. Judges chapter 3, verse 1. Judges 3 and 1. And it reads, Now these are the nations with the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of, the, of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. Only that generation of the children of Israel, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war. At the least, such as before knew nothing thereof. You know, what's, what's God saying here? That when the children of Israel went over into the promised land, God would not allow Joshua and the generation that came over with him into the promised land to defeat and remove all of Israel's enemies. By the time of Judges here in chapter 3, Joshua dies. In chapter 1 of Judges, Joshua died. Caleb, gone. All those great men of faith who came over with Joshua, they're gone. That generation is gone. This is a new generation. A generation has never fought. And you know what God says? I'm not going to let Joshua and that generation Fight all your battles. He let some inhabitants, some evil remain in the land just so that this new succeeding generation can have somebody to fight. Oh, my God. 
God knows how to train his people. You know what? Your mama is not going to be able to get rid of all your enemies. I know your grandmama was a praying woman. But she's not going to be able to fight all your battles. I know your parents have, have laid up an inheritance for you and made life easy. <laughs> but there are some things your parents can't take care of. God's got some enemies waiting for you to turn that corner, but not to worry. He don't have them enemies there so they can win. He have them there so you can win to teach you to fight. And this is the problem. We have a generation that don't know how to fight. We know how to negotiate. We, we, we know how to a uh, bureaucrat. But we don't know how to fight. No. We know how to push buttons. We know how to squeeze triggers. We know how to drop bonds, but nobody know how to fight no more. Fighting is different than squeezing a trigger. See, we, we want God to squeeze a trigger and evaporate all of our enemies. Ain't no triggers here. You got to put your dukes up. You got to wrestle this thing down. You got to know how to fight. And God wants you to fight. Fight that thing. Wrestle that thing down. And sometimes when you fight, the enemy don't drop at the first blow. You got to keep blowing at him. You're going to have to keep strangling him. Some of you done quit because you ain't used to fighting. You, 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 you didn't grow up fighting. You grow up hitting buttons and stuff started just eliminated. No, fighting don't work that way. You got to strangle these things down and you got to beat it into submission. And God put it there to teach you the endurance of fighting. You ought to thank God for it. It's going to make you a better man. It's going to make you a better woman. And Joshua's not going to fight all your battles. Some of you might remember, I said to you that the name Joshua, that the name Joshua is the Hebrew equivalent of the name Jesus. That is, Jesus is the Greek name of the Hebrew name Joshua. They're the same name. One's a Greek translation, one's a Hebrew translation. If we take that, if we place that in this text, guess what? Jesus is not going to fight all your battles. That is, the new birth, what Jesus did in salvation in the new birth, being born again, being regenerated, isn't going to fix all your problems. Even after the work Jesus did to save your spirit and to give you a new life, there are still enemies. Go with me to James chapter 1. See, some people don't realize this. That's why they're so shocked that even after they come to the Lord, you know, uh, they still don't act like the Lord. <laughs> well, it's because you got some enemies to fight, some enemies that don't want you to walk in his steps, some enemies that don't want you uh, living like him. And you got to fight some battles even after even after you come to the Lord, even after the work Jesus did. Jesus is not going to remove all your enemies out of your life. God has some enemies right in your own body, your own flesh that you're going to have to eliminate. He's not going to do it. Coming down to the altar ain't going to help. No, it's not going to work. I know you want to come, Lord, lay hands on me and cast out this spirit of lust. He ain't going to do it. He ain't going to do it. He ain't going to do it. You know what you got to do? You got to kill it. See, that's how you make a man out of a man. You want to take a boy, you want to make him a man? Don't kill his enemy. Put the knife in his hand. You say, you cut his throat. That's how you make a man out of him. And that's what God has done. He's going to give you the sword of the spirit. Well, don't ask me to do it. Here, you take it. Stick it inside of him. He ain't going to get up. Trust me. Stab it. Cut his throat. Stick him. <laughs> yeah, that'll make a man out of you. You do it a couple of times. Notice, this is what God expects us to do. James chapter 1. James 1. I know this might sound, man, it's not violent. Yes, yeah, life can be violent. And the enemy is violent. James 1, 21. James 1, 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word. Use the word to do what? Save your soul. So, you know what it tells us? That when you come to the Lord, your spirit gets saved, but your soul ain't saved. You know what your job is? To save your own soul. Oh, Lord, save my soul. No, that's your job. I saved your spirit, you saved your soul, 
And if you save your soul, I'll give you a new body. You see, God starts it and he finishes. He starts, he gives you a new spirit. Now, if you take that new spirit and put the sword in the spirit, that's what the sword of the spirit is. It's not the sword for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit don't need a sword. He ain't fighting. You are. Your adversary, the devil. No, the sword of the spirit is the sword for your spirit. Your spirit is like the Israelite going into Canaan. And all of your attitude and, and your pride and your arrogance, that's all the Canaanites. And your job is to take the sword and put it in the hand of your spirit and kill all of it. See, this is why God will sometimes put us into bad situations to let that anger come out, to show you he's still there. He's still there. Oh, she thought, I'm saved. No, no, not, not as saved as you thought you were. This is why God, God let your neighbor get the house and you didn't. So jealousy arise up. So you can see, okay, now you got to kill it. He's letting these things happen because he knows what. See, the flesh only rises when you tempt it. See, the flesh will be quiet. You, you will never know it's there. But when you start stepping on its toes, when you start poking it, that's when the flesh stand up. And when the flesh stand up, your job, your duty is to cut its throat, to kill it by denying it, telling it to shut up. Not allowing it to express itself. Oh, I'm mad. I'm I'm upset. I just got a vent. No, cut the throat and shut up. That's how you crucify the flesh. Don't let it. Don't let it exercise itself. Don't. Don't don't let it exhibit itself. Shut it down. And you do that enough, you will put it to death and God will keep putting you in those circumstances until it no longer comes out. And he expects every time it rises up, it's a fight. Kill it. Kill that attitude. That attitude of thinking ain't nobody caring about me. I'm all over here and, and ain't nobody called me. Why my kids always got to battle me? So teach you some patience. See, you want every time you walk in the door, you say something, you want everybody just to do it. So God put you in a situation, gave you some kids that it ain't doing it right away to teach you some. Come on, somebody. He, he will always put you in situations to make you better. He's not doing it for their good. He's doing it for your good. So what you want to do, you want to fight the wolves. No, you don't fight the wolves. You stump on the serpents. You go to war against the devil. I don't know if you got anything out of this. I don't know if this is helping you, but I'm telling you, if you can't wrap your mind around this now, you don't want to see what's coming. Stop blaming this stuff on the devil. Stop blaming it on the Illuminati and, and all these secret groups conspiracies it's the Lord say it out of your mouth it's the Lord's doing and it's marvelous <laughs> the question is why is he doing it but I know it's the Lord I ain't giving the devil no I ain't giving the credit to to, to governments and administrations and presidents and law I ain't, I'm giving the credit to God and I'm asking him Lord what you want us to do about this and that's how the saints who have knowledge, who have some understanding. That's how we ought to approach it. Let me pray for you today. Bow your heads. Father, we pray. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice today. I pray these words, they're, they're heavy. They're, they're, they're some, for some of us, they're very, very difficult for us to embrace and wrap our minds around. But Lord, by your grace, you can cause us to embrace them, to accept them, and to understand them. And I pray that we would walk with understanding. We would live with understanding. We will not live like the world who lacks understanding, but that we will understand that we serve an almighty God, a God who rules in the kingdoms of men, a God who works all things things after the counsel of his will and works all things together for our good. We do not fall into the frenzy of this world. We do not walk in the, in the anxiety and the fear of this world. You have not given us the spirit of fear. 
You've given us a spirit of love and power, a sound mind. I pray that we would operate in that sound mind today. And uh, we just take authority over every reasoning and every false thought that's contrary to your word and what we have received on today. We cast it out of our minds and we replace it with your truths. We thank you for this, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Give me what to say. Let me hear you. Thank you for listening. If this teaching has been a blessing to you and you'd like to partner with our ministry to share the message of Jesus Christ, please visit our website at www.hmclive.org and click the donate button. If you're in our area, we invite you to join us at 4317 Lippincott Boulevard, Burton, Michigan, 48519, Harris Memorial Church of God in Christ, teaching the truth and showing the love.